we've begun to recognize that uh, HPV positive and HPV negative cancers really are distinct groups. Uh, we know now that molecularly they're distinct, they're, they're different cancers biologically, and as you might guess, that translates into differences in clinical profile, presentation, uh, and uh, some other things that you know, we've seen in the clinic. In fact, it was the clinical observations first that made us, that gave us a clue that something different was, was going on. HPV negative cancers are the traditional, if you will, typical head and neck cancer. Uh, these are tobacco associated uh, cancers for the most part, not exclusively. There are some non smokers that can get HPV negative cancers, but for the most part, they're associated with tobacco use. Alcohol use um, can act synergistically with tobacco, uh, although alone it, it usually is not a major risk factor. Uh, tobacco really uh, becomes that. There are some other minor uh, risk factors uh, for head and neck cancer as well. And there are some genetic syndromes that can predispose uh, patients, such as Fanconi anemia, but that's fairly rare. So those are the HPV negative uh, uh, subgroup, and they are, uh, can occur in the oral cavity, the oropharynx, hypopharynx, and larynx. Whereas for HPV positive, we see a little bit of a different clinical scenario. Here we see patients who are usually non-smokers and non-drinkers. And again, that is what clued us in to the fact that something different was happening. We began to ask ourselves, why are these patients getting cancers of the tonsil and the base of the tongue when they have no apparent risk factors? And of course, uh, several years later, we discovered that uh, these cancers harbored a virus called the human papillomavirus, and that that virus appeared to be the etiologic agent for these uh, cancers. Uh, HPV positive patients tend to be younger. They're about a decade younger than their HPV negative counterpart. Um, interestingly, the male to female ratio is three to one, uh, and we're beginning to discover why that is. Uh, there may be differences in the ability of men and women when exposed to the virus to actually clear it. And, and apparently, from the data that we have, um, women are better at clearing the virus than, than men are. Uh, and, and, and we don't know the reasons uh, behind that yet. Uh, in addition, uh, these patients, of course, we know that HPV positive cancers are associated with sexual activity. This is a sexually transmitted disease, just like any other HPV related uh, malignancy, cervical cancer, anal cancer, penile cancer, HPV positive head and neck cancer is no exception. These are associated with, um, with sexual contact. And then with respect to the uh, um, incidence, we see dramatic differences. Whereas, especially in the United States, people got the message that smoking is bad for you and began to stop smoking about two decades, maybe three decades ago. And with that, we've seen a lower incidence of smoking-related head and neck cancers, especially those of the larynx, which is the classic uh, smoking-related head and neck cancer. In the meantime, we've seen actually an increase in HPV positive oropharynx cancers. And in fact, that increase has been dramatic. Uh, it's been about 3% per year uh, for the last 30 years. And if you add all that up, we're getting to the point where HPV positive cancers in the United States in numbers are going to overtake the HPV negative cancers. And um, what's alarming, if you look at the incidence in the epidemiologic data, is that the incidence curves are not flattening out at all. In fact, if anything, they're becoming more acute, suggesting that we're only at the beginning of this epidemic, in a sense, of HPV-positive oropharynx cancers. When we talk about uh, HPV, human papillomavirus, uh, in head and neck cancer, the, we think of it as a, a new subset of patients. Uh, and to some extent, uh, it is. But if you go back to the 30s and 40s, uh, about 10% of head and neck cancers actually had HPV uh, DNA, H HPV infection. Uh, when we looked in Pittsburgh uh, in the early 80s, it had gotten up to 20 or 30%. Um, this is not of all areas of the head and neck. Interestingly, the HPV uh, subset is restricted to an area called the oropharynx. That's not the front part of the mouth or tongue and it's not way down in the voice box, it's in the middle, the tonsil and the base of the tongue, the tonsils that many of us had removed when we were kids, but there's also tonsil tissue, that lumpy part in the back of the tongue, where if you stick your finger back there, you'd gag yourself, that lumpy part is also tonsil tissue, and that seems to be where the HPV 
infects preferentially and turns into cancers, turns the cell into a malignant uh, tumor. So the increase from 20 to 30 percent of the oropharynx, not of the voice box and not of the front part of the mouth, but in the oropharynx, that increase has gone from 20% up to 80%. So really the vast majority of tonsil and base of tongue tumors, the oropharyngeal carcinomas are now HPV uh, driven. <clears throat> and this uh, increase um, uh, has been seen with a, a rate of about 5% per year, every year, to where HPV positive head and neck cancers uh, have essentially now equaled and overtaken the HPV-positive cervical cancers in the U.S. Screening for HPV or pharynx cancer is a little bit tricky. Whereas for the cervix, we have uh, a wonderful test uh, that's been, of course, developed over the last uh, several decades and now uh, is, it involves really molecular testing at the molecular level for the actual virus. That's a lot more challenging to do in the oropharynx. And, and the reason behind that is, is goes back to the biology of HPV. Um, first of all, the oropharynx is not the most readily accessible site. Um, we should predicate all of these statements with re remembering the fact that HPV-positive oropharynx cancer occurs almost exclusively in the tonsil and the base of tongue. And these are areas that are difficult to get at with a uh, a brush or some sort of instrument that could scrape off uh, the layer of cells or, or the uh, um, first layer of the mucosa. So first of all, it's, anatomically, it's, it's a little bit more challenging. But uh, more importantly, when we think about where the HPV virus resides and where these cancers start, we realize that it's in the crypts of the tonsils and the lymph lymphatic areas of the base of tongue. So when, when if, you, if we remember back to medical school and, and our histology classes, we remember that the tonsil is essentially a type of lymph node. And uh, its, its histological structure is made up of crypts and, um, and, and surrounding uh, a very dense uh, lymphatic infiltrate. Well, the HPV virus actually infects the cells at the base of those crypts. And so even if we were able to scrape off the, um, the surface layer, we actually wouldn't get to the uh, cells that the HPV virus resides in. So it's been somewhat challenging, in fact, quite challenging, to come up with a screening test for HPV or pharynx cancers. Some people have used oral rinses, and those are somewhat helpful in the sense that at least we can identify an individual who harbors a high-risk HPV infection in the oral cavity or, or in the upper air digestive tract. Um, but uh, the problem with that is that when we look at population studies that have done that, we recognize that there are somewhere in the range of about uh, one to two million people in the United States, million, that are infected, that have an oral infection for a high-risk HPV strain. Well, if you do the numbers, we realize that a very small fraction of that will actually develop head and neck cancer. So it doesn't really become a great screening tool.